Okay, so it looks like uh, everyone's uh, joined, our, our numbers uh, stabilised. So welcome to this afternoon's meeting. Uh, this meeting will be put in place by the um, Institute of Biological Science to, uh, as a hopefully will be a regular session for us all, uh, to get together to present what we're doing within the IBMS and how we can help you. Uh, it's also for training officers out there um, amongst you uh, to introduce you to the role of the practice educators, that is a role that's been rolled out within England, uh, the NHS in England. Uh, over the last uh, few months or so and it's a, a great way for everyone to make sure uh, they know what those roles are about and how they can access them but whilst also finding out more about uh, for those of you who don't know about the Institute of Biological Science about what the Institute is offering uh, to its members and to uh, the biological science workforce in general. So a few points of uh, housekeeping so firstly this webinar has been recorded uh, clearly none of the, none of the attendees uh, you're, you're not known uh, to the system um, but we will hopefully make this recording available on our website afterwards uh, if, if the recording goes well uh, and uh, that means you can share that with your colleagues if there's anything in here that uh, you find useful also you can dip back in uh, if you want any resources uh, we'll also try to make the slide deck available um, to you all as well afterwards but I, I haven't checked with our comms people whether that's possible but hopefully uh, we can uh, please, uh, in terms of questions and answers, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. Uh, how much time we'll have will depend on how quickly we get through everything. But if you do put your, uh, your questions in the chat box and we'll try to cover as many of those as we can. Uh, if not, we'll try to get back to any key questions after that one. Like I said, that is all time, de uh, time dependent. And any queries you've got after this, please do drop us an email to our comms uh, at IVMS uh, email address and we shall endeavour to get back to you. Okay, next slide please, Dan. I, I assume things I can do next slide. Okay, so um, one thing I haven't done is the instructions. So um, first of all, sorry, uh, we've skipped a slide somewhere. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm David Wells. I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the Institute of Biomedical Science. Um, to join me also today, we have got Ruth Thompson. Uh, Ruth? Oh, hi everyone. I'm Ruth Thompson. I'm Scientific Lead for London and leading the Practice Educator Programme for Pathology Workforce. Thank you for inviting me. That's it. Thank you and welcome Ruth. Uh, and also uh, joining me is uh, Alan Wainwright. Hello, I'm Alan Wainwright. I'm Executive Head of Education at the Institute of Biomedical Science. And then last but no means least, uh, Sarah May. Hello, I'm Sarah May and I'm David's Deputy at the Institute of Biomedical Science. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, one person you can't see, but we'll often hear us say, Dan, please help, is uh, Dan Nimmo, who's our uh, Head of Communications. So uh, thank you, Dan, as well, for your support today. So moving on to the next slide, please. So a little bit for those of you who don't know who the Institute are, so this, there will be some of the audience who may not be fully aware. Uh, the Institute of Biomedical Science uh, is the pressure body for biomedical scientists and clinical scientists working within uh, the biomedical science arena. Um, most of our members, of, of which we have about uh, 21,000 across 74 countries, actually work within the, the NHS, within the UK Four Nations. Uh, we're here to support, progress and promote uh, biomedical science. Uh, we've been established since about 1912 uh, and our, our work is really to educate, train and uh, promote uh, the work of biomedical science and biomedical scientists uh, within, within laboratory medicine, uh, making sure that actually we achieve some of the highest standards possible. Uh, I think throughout our history we've uh, worked closely with uh, the governments of the day and also industry and other partners to make sure that A, uh, we have a workforce that is uh, state registered, uh, that we work with the laboratories um, that are highly accredited um, and, um, and can demonstrate a, a significant level of quality uh, in, in that we were part of the founding organisations for CPA UK, which went on to uh, host the ISO 15189 standards with UCAS. And we've also uh, built upon this and the main topic of today's conversation is our education programme to support people. Next slide, please, Dan. So like I said, our main aims really around uh, supporting the workforce, uh, progressing the work we do within biomedical science and also to promote that. Next slide, please, Dan. Uh, if you go onto our website, you can see a whole range of things that we do uh, if you're not aware of them. Uh, and uh, Dan will post a, a suitable link somewhere for us to, to pick that up. Next slide, please. 
So a little bit about uh, where we're going to in the next five years or so. So um, those of you who may or may not know, I only joined uh, the Institute as uh, Chief Executive in June this year, uh, but I've been involved in the Institute for many years before that. Uh, but we've uh, agreed with our council a strategy going forward for the next five years to really expand the work we're doing uh, in this area. The strategy itself is actually broken down into two parts. I'm only going to talk in, about the first part, which is our education uh, strategy. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So the first thing we're going to do is actually we intend to, in an area which I know we do get uh, criticism about, is actually to be uh, support more access to HCP registration uh, through better uptake of our entry routes. Uh, Alan's going to talk about this in a lot more detail, but actually what we, we are going to do over the next five years is to make sure that all our routes to HCPC registration uh, are clear and fit for purpose. Um, we know that there are some challenges around accredited degrees and non-accredited degrees in universities uh, around the uh, equivalence um, programmes uh, and experiential routes to, to uh, HCPC. Uh, and we want to make sure that we make those as clear as possible, as early as possible, particularly to, to our A-level students, so that we get the right workforce at the right time. Uh, we also want to work with the with the various different governments uh, across the UK and uh, uh, organisations such as Health Education England to make sure that we're supporting uh, the placement of work of, of students. Uh, clearly, this is a role that uh, we all struggle with. It's not uh, not always in the gift of the institute to make sure there are enough placements, but actually to make sure we can do all we can to support the system to make sure uh, that people come into the profession in the right way. And also, we want to work with the higher education institutions around making sure that. Their degrees really are uh, ones that, that deliver a workforce that are fit for purpose uh, of the, for the future, but also make sure that is as, as smooth a process as possible so people can come into the workforce uh, adding value immediately. Next slide, please, Dan. Next thing we want to do is a bit more uh, broad, more broader, and that's actually making sure that our, our training offering to our existing members uh, is again fit for purpose. So not only are we talking about bringing more people into uh, into biomedical science, but making sure that actually our our routes to further education, the CPD, etc., are also fit for purpose. Uh, so some of you may be aware that we're launching an e we have launched an e learning platform. We want to expand that greatly. Uh, we want to make sure that our, our membership grades have the right uh, CPD and educational routes available to those, uh, including expanding our informatics and digital applications, uh, increasing our offering for things like point of care molecular to more people, not just uh, qualified individuals, uh, making sure we modulise our content so people can mix and match uh, accordingly, but also can build their qualifications over time in a, in a way that suits them better. Uh, than perhaps at the moment we, we do. Uh, and also making sure that actually, although it's got to improve our fellowship membership grade offer, actually the offer across the board is fit for purpose to retrain not only our entry level staff, but also our very, very senior staff in leadership and uh, clinical practice. And also to make sure we're working with you right across the country to make sure this is right as well. Next slide, please, Dan. And then the last part is an area which um, Sarah will touch on is making sure that we actually deliver the highest possible qualifications to our, our workforce, making sure that actually we have a full curriculum in advanced practice qualifications covering all the relevant disciplines. We've got a lot of people working in advanced roles uh, that they have developed over, the, over time, and we want to make sure we support those with according uh, educational programmes and, and curriculum uh, to cover that to, to enable them to evidence their, their practice. Uh, and we want again to make sure that we're working with the various fund holders to make sure that actually that makes sense to people and it's part of a, a key solution uh, for uh, our workforce. Uh, training of biomedical scientists is, is actually normally, in, in comparison to other workforce, actually quite cheap, but actually what we do need to do is make sure it is correct as well, and that's one thing we want to work really closely with. And also we want to make sure that we step, we move stepwise with our, our stakeholders, so working with the school, with the academy, with the Royal College of Pathologists, etc, to make sure that actually we uh, move in a way that is fit for purpose for everybody and, and is supported more broadly. So really, that's what our plan is for the next uh, uh, next five years. Clearly, a lot of these pieces of work may well take a number of years, but there's a few things that we're going to be working on in the short term to make sure we improve things. And some of those are around those routes to access to make sure we improve those during this time of uh, increased pressure upon our laboratories. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So now I'm going to hand over seamlessly to Ruth, who's going to uh, introduce the role of the practice educators for, for those who don't know. Thank you, Ruth. 
Oh, thank you, David. And thank you very much for inviting me. I don't have a slide deck. I've just got to look at my face. I'm sorry about that. Um, so what I wanted to do is just share a little understanding of the work that we did and how we've ended up with this weird person called a practice educator in the system. Uh, and it came out of a piece of work that we did in London across our five networks during the COVID response, where we identified uh, workforce as a key challenge in order to be able to deliver the route to 3000 PCR tests. Uh, and that feels like a very long time ago now, but it was a real challenge at the time. We developed, uh, based on the learning uh, we had across London, the concept of practice educators as really good facility facilitators and change agents in, in sharing the development offer for our learners. So we hear the word practice educators a lot across um, different professional groups, but not within healthcare science and certainly not within biomedical science. Uh, we have training officers, I think, in labs and um, does speak to a quite an older way of developing learners and it doesn't align with the ways of um, thinking around developing learners and um, developing our workforce. So um, in London, what we've had, uh, and this isn't London telling the rest of the country what to do, but in, just as an example, and this is where I lead, um, we've had some very innovative work that's happened that's helped us uh, look at the challenges across the system and help with collaboration and developing programmes where we've maybe been weak with training in one space, but, and, but, but had capacity in another space. Anyway, um, what happened was uh, we were funded to develop uh, uh, a network of practice educators um, by the COVID response team. And we got funding for a half time uh, person, 8B practice educator per network. And so that funding went out to each region uh, to fund a practice educator for half time at quite a high level with the understanding that they would help support and understand workforce challenges and act as uh, change agents within that system to develop uh, systems which can help meet and understand local workforce challenges. Um, we also at the same time had a, a 0.5 whole time equivalent lead for um, apprentices because we felt that the legacy of um, where we were with COVID in taking on an awful lot of, for example, um, um, medical lab assistants that actually we may have an opportunity to develop some apprenticeship models around that space. So, so each region had one person half time to think about that. Um, and, and we also got some investment for a development programme to support the practice educators as they stepped into this weird space of leading across a network for the workforce and understanding its, its, um, its own needs in terms of own needs and challenges in terms of workforce. And so what we've done is we've, we've, we've put in place a, um, a national board to see and oversee the development and implementation of the practice educators. And we, we've grown to have two cohorts now. Um, and we have some good governance where we report into the workforce board nationally. Um, we, uh, the regions have funded these, these, um, these opportunities as best they can for their population. So in London, they're called practice educators. The money was gifted to each network and they recruited someone to work within their network and still work with them. Other people have used the funding in different ways and the regions have used that appropriately. And that's exactly the thinking behind that was it wasn't that one size fits all, but they're within, within England, and this was across England, within England, there were different ways of working in different systems. Um, but that all the practice educators across the networks would be networked and that they would be able to share best practice, innovation and new ideas and how to look at the challenges we had across workforce. And, and they were to meet the region's needs and they were to be identified by the region. So the initial piece of work that they've undertaken is to look at a skills gap and workforce gap analysis. And so you may have seen some questionnaires come out and maybe been asked questions around the challenges that you're facing around progressing workforce or the challenges you've got that are actually gaps within your system. Practice educators are also going on of a very well thought through seven month development programme that's being hosted by the Academy for Healthcare Science. It's not an academic program, it's, it's, it's delivered by a faculty who've been delivering the practical skills in education, training, leadership 
um, for healthcare scientists. And they've, they've already delivered a programme, not quite as intensively like this specifically for a, a pathology, but they've been delivering it across the scientific community for over five years, it's won awards, and they're very, very skilled faculty in supporting our and developing our educators. Um, where we are at the moment is we've had two cohorts go through the Practice Educator Programme. It's not finished, they're, they're in that space. Uh, they've got a very proactive WhatsApp group uh, and we've got an amazing futures platform um, that has been developed by Bassett and Divine, Bassett being the lead for apprenticeships and Divine being the National Pathology Fellow that are supporting and developing the practice educator networks as they establish and build in confidence and leadership. There are specific outcomes that that programme has to be, but the heading is that it's a place to think a place to plan and a place to be. So it's putting resilience back into that workforce as well. And just the update from my one of my local regional um, practice educators out in one of the networks is that so far they've built connections locally, regionally and nationally. They've captured the current training status and workforce data. They've uh, distributed the surveys out into training leads across the, the, their network. They've carried out detailed stakeholder analysis and they set up a communication plan out to the system. They've done four of their training programme days. This one's on the second cohort. Um, they're thinking about their trio meetings, so they're sharing thinking across different spaces, um, different parts of the country. And they're having fortni fortnightly meetings with the pathology regional uh, leads and fortni fortnightly um, regional meetings with their own practice educators within their region. And then they're working on the apprenticeship offer with Bassett out into the system as well. So we feel really well, We've, um, we have put in for funding to continue the practice educator as a, as a specific person in this space um, into the um, funding review for the England health system. Um, and so we're hopeful that that will carry on. The whole programme itself is being evaluated by um, the Leadership Academy lead that's just retired and she's she's doing a really good job at capturing and understanding the impact and value of practice edges. So we should have some good evidence and data around that as we as we uh, go into next year. Um, so that's about it for practice educators. It's an emerging and exciting space to be in, very positive. And the, pe the people who are there will curate a colloquium and share their learning with you um, at the end of the Practice Educator Programme. So, so there'll be some exciting outputs from them as well. Um, and that's me finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, for a useful introduction there. So uh, following on from that then, uh, so turning to uh, Alan, who's the, who's the lead in to what is essentially for those who aren't aware, uh, but also as a refresher for, for those of you who are aware, what the offering is from the, from the Institute of Biomedical Science in terms of training our workforce. So, Alan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. Okay, I'm going to talk about three areas, um, support staff, routes to, routes to HCPC registration and specialist portfolio. So, the next slide, please, Dan. Um, this is the Institute's qualification framework, which um, really has been in existence for over 15 years now. It's, it sort of mirrors the modernising scientific career structure that we've got. And I'm going to be talking about the, the red, blue and green boxes. So um, I will stress at this point, the certificates of achievement, which are for support staff, do not lead directly to registration uh, as a biomedical scientist, which is why there's no connecting error to that. So next slide, please, Dan. So the for support staff qualifications, these are really a an alternative offered by the institute to NVQs and, and HS HS H indeed qualifications. They're not academic. They are demonstrating achievement of competence and professional practice at support level. That's pre-registration for biomedical scientists. Um, recognizing that staff. Uh, can be developed in laboratory techniques. Some of these staff will have degrees already, so that's why it's not a, an academic qualification. Um, in the next slide, please, Dan. 
we're offering them to the people, bands two and three, who haven't necessarily got qualification requirements. They don't need to be uh, a member of the Institute and Certificate of Achievement Part One will um, enable them to develop and get used to completing portfolios of evidence. Certificates of Achievement Part Two are really for band fours, and there are entry requirements. Um, they need to be a member of the Institute or a registered science technician. They need to have a level three, level six in Scotland qualification that's related to biological science. So they've got some scientific background and they also need to have le le relevant laboratory experience. Next slide, please, Dan. The structure of the portfolios, there's, there's five functional areas. So the ones that you can see are really relating to um, standard processes and, and development within a laboratory setting. And there are core and optional modules for these areas. And particularly in performing standard tests, the, the options are increasing uh, so that they can be tailored to particular disciplines. The idea is that the training and assessment of knowledge and competence is guided by the portfolio. It relates to the practice of the individual in the, the laboratory that they're working with. There are set tasks uh, as evidence, and it's all done internally. There's no external assessment. When the candidate has completed the qualifications, the trainer or manager submits a declaration of completion to the Institute, and we will award the relevant certificate of achievement um, certificate for that. The next slide, please, Dan. Okay, the routes to HCPC registration as a biomedical scientist. I'm going to go through these in a bit more detail because it's important to understand the differences between them. Um, basically, for to be registered as a biomedical scientist, which is the protected title, you have to have a, an honours degree that's been accredited by the, the Institute or an equivalent to that degree and completion of the Institute's registration training portfolio for the award of a certificate of competence. So it's a combination of academic qualification at honours level and the professional practice through the portfolio that enables somebody to be eligible to apply for HCPC registration. Unfortunately, biomedical science itself is not a protected title for degrees. Um, so there are biomedical sciences, um, degrees that are not accredited by the Institute. They do not come near to the, the content of an accredited degree. And this can be misleading for students and some employers if they don't, are not fully aware of the purpose of accreditation and the difference between the accredited biomedical science degree and other types of life sciences or biomedical sciences degrees. Um, the curriculum, it's very important to understand this, um, but the curriculum is defined by the QAA subject benchmark statement and the HCPC standards of proficiency. So I'll show, show you the next slide. This is what defines us as a profession of biomedical scientists. And I noticed um, a question in the, in the, uh, the, the Q&A room and about top-up qualifications. And one of the problems with top-up, if, if somebody does not have an accredited degree and there's a shortfall in their education, shortfall could be in any of the key or core subjects that are required to be a registered biomedical scientist. And there's no way around this situation. If somebody does not have this knowledge, then they will need to acquire it in order to become registered. So the core subjects really underpin the key disciplines. You see there, there are eight different disciplines. We've got clinical genetics in since 2009, and we are covering all of the pathology disciplines. At this level, graduates will be generic when they apply for HCPC registration don't specialise until they complete the Institute's portfolio, which I'll come to later. Um, that provides flexibility in the workforce, because the, which is important because the universities offering accredited degrees are not, um, they're not funded to offer the degrees. There's no workforce planning for biomedical scientists as such, and the, the universities are able to offer the, the degrees because they're also offering to other students that go into employment in biomedical science, not necessarily becoming registered with the HCP. So the next slide, please. 
Okay, the preferred options um, for be eligible to become HCPC registered is the degree within integrated placement, which we call the applied biomedical science degree. This also includes the apprenticeship model, which is a part-time delivery for, for students that are in employment as an apprenticeship. And it also includes the healthcare science PTP model. Um, we used to have, a, we've got about 50 degrees that are accredited currently by the Institute. There used to be about 11 PTP programs, but we're down to two or three of those at the moment. All of these integrated degrees uh, include several weeks placement, to combine professional practice with the academic degree in order to become eligible. And the students will graduate eligible to apply for HCPC registration by virtue of completing the conference. The other preferred alternative is an accredited degree followed by professional training and completion of the training portfolio for the specific competence. And that usually takes about 18 months training in an approved IBMS laboratory. All of training, all of the training must take place in institute approved laboratories. And if there is structured training and a commitment by the laboratory and the student to complete their training, it is manageable within 12 months. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the non-accredited degree um, is the one where often, or in most cases, do not meet the criteria for HCPC registration. Um, the graduate is required to achieve the equivalent of an institute accredited degree. As I've said, it's defined by the benchmark statement and the HCPC stands of proficiency. So they must have knowledge of all key disciplines in biomedical science. So that we have a process for assessing the degree against the curriculum and identifying the shortfall. Depending on the shortfall, this may require uh, a number of modules, the supplementary education, or it may not require any, depending on the, the degree that the person has got. Um, and then to, to, to complete the top up, they will either follow a designated program, which is present in some universities or individual modules from an accredited degree course. The university they apply to will decide how best to um, address the shortfall. And we have a list of those universities on the website. Next slide, please. I'll give you a couple of case studies just to demonstrate the sort of things we have. Um, we might have a, a graduate presenting with a microbiology degree. This could be a medical microbiology. It could be industrial microbiology. And in this example, uh, we've identified short seven key disciplines that are short. Um, so one of them in this case is, is that medical microbiology is, is in present. So the they will have to enroll on a program of study to address the shortfall, which could take um, a couple of years and probably going to cost about £6,000 for. Um, second case study, they presented a chemistry degree. Again, um, it may not be relevant to clinical biochemistry that we're used to. The, the assessment in this case identifies a shortfall in core subjects as well as all key disciplines. So the likelihood of this example is that it was, a, it was a, a pure chemistry type of degree. So the ineffective graduate will have to complete an accredited biomedical science degree. I'm sure for. In the next slide, please. We've got an alternative option for those that have uh, an honours degree and are currently working in healthcare science. We'll stress this is not for support staff. Um, because they're not, they do not have autonomous professional practice uh, in their portfolio. Um, it requires a minimum of three years autonomous professional practice to be eligible for this. Candidates must be working in healthcare science in the UK, and they must have experience of routine analysis of specimens. In essence, they are working in a role that is comparable to a biomedical scientist, but they are not registered with the HCPC. And in terms of protection of the public, they should be registered with the HPP that they're carrying out. The next slide, please. So if we have a, a simple case study, we've got somebody that's working in clinical genetics as a band five technical officer. They have an honours degree in life sciences. They've got the autonomous practice. 
they've got experience of medical microbiology techniques. Um, they've got experience of the normal procedures within a, a clinical laboratory. And um, although they have a life sciences degree, they are lacking key disciplines, cellular pathology, clinical biochemistry, et cetera. Um, but what they can do in this case is they can demonstrate their knowledge of the disciplines through experiential learning. They can go into a secondment into other laboratories to get that knowledge. We're not requiring them to go to university to do uh, for this particular route. What they have to do is produce a portfolio of evidence to show how they meet the HCPC standards of proficiency. So it's comparable with our other routes to, to registration. The bulk of the evidence should come from their degree and their current role, and additional evidence will come from CPD activities, self-directed learning, or the, a secondment for laboratories, or they may choose to go to university to um, do some pop-up policies. It's not a simpler route to registration. It actually involves as much work, if not more work, than the, um, the standard routes, but it is taken into account experience that people will already have. The next slide, please. Okay, we have a final route uh, for clinical scientists, a certificate of attainment, experiential route. This is recognizing biomedical scientists that have uh, developed their practice to the equivalent to what a clinical scientist is doing, which is perfectly permissible within the standard proficiency for, for biomedical scientists. But we've created this because there was a time when biomedical scientists couldn't access the higher specialist scientific training uh, because it required registrations of clinical scientists. It's not approved by the HCPC as a training route. It involves a portfolio of evidence in the same way as the um, equivalent route for clinical uh, for biomedical scientists requires. Um, but it is based on the um, experience and assessment to reach the level of the clinical scientists that our medical scientists have already achieved and it's through portfolio of evidence and uh, evaluate at the end of the uh, of the assessment the next slide please the portfolio of evidence just a general slide in terms of how the evidence is built up through qualifications um, which could relate some of the evidence from those can relate to standards of proficiency experiential learning, professional competencies, government training, short courses, research projects and collaboration. So there is plenty of scope for gathering evidence through training or uh, at all of the levels of the portfolio in the next slide, please. Challenges uh, for integrated degrees and sandwich degrees are basically placement opportunities. As I mentioned, there, there is no workforce planning, there are no funded placements, so it is entirely at the um, behest of the employers to whether they can uh, create placement opportunities for students. These routes are very dependent on the interrelationship between employers and universities in terms of um, developing the programmes and also the placement. With a non-accredited degree, um, costed cost of assessment for people is £300, but the cost of supplementary education is, is and it's seen as prohibitive for some employees, some individuals. For all routes, uh, I think it is a problem generally in the profession that train officers are rarely supplementary, such so, so supernumeraries rather. Um, lack of funding for training exists apart from uh, with apprenticeships where it, it's lacking for training, but it, but it will fund the degree that some people have. So the apprenticeship route is proving popular for support staff that may have a, um, not have a degree, but I experienced support staff and can go to a degree part time. The registration is biomedical that way. And finally, the last few slides are on. Next slide, please, on specialist diplomas. Really, this is turning the um, biomedical scientists at the generic level of registration into a specialist. Um, through um, a vocational qualification. Training is undertaken in a, an IBMS approved laboratory. The endpoint review is of the portfolio of evidence and assessment by an external examiner. Please. Next. 
Okay, we've got uh, just final slide. Um, just to increase flexibility of the portfolios and recognising some changes that are undergoing in pathology, we're looking at re uh, badging them in terms of smaller units with core and optional modules to better reflect the requirements of laboratories, looking to provide e-learning support, and the aims are to specifically tailor them to employer needs, to remove the potential need for secondments, um, to offer more choice in disciplines that are not strongly established in biomedical science, and also to provide online, online learning support um, for the uh, acquisition of knowledge. That's my final slide, so I, I now to Sarah May. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, I'm now going to take you through the qualifications and the options that people have um, from beyond the specialist diploma. Next slide, please, Dan. Um, this is going to be the higher specialist diploma, and we'll have a look at the diplomas of expert practice and the certificates. And what I want to talk about is the complementarity of some and the alternative to the HSD, which can be the Diploma of Expert Practice. Apologies if, if for anyone who's not familiar with our qualification structure, but we've been developing qualifications for nearly 20 years, largely in response to service need. So it, it's become quite a comprehensive um, structure, more of a matrix now than anything. Uh, first point I'd like to get across, could I have the next slide please, Dan? I want to dispel any notion of non-transferability because we very frequently hear people saying, ah, oh, but the qualifications aren't recognized outside of the profession. And that's true of any professional qualification, but it doesn't take into account the knowledge and skills. And I think it's really important for anyone who is skeptical or wonders about the value of a professional qualification to say that the people who um, have been through our qualifications, any or many of them, in addition to the specific and general science that obviously they acquire through their practice and their learning, they have a good understanding of the UK healthcare systems and regulation, good laboratory practice and with some good clinical practice is part and parcel of the fabric of what they're going to learn. There'll be research principles and methodologies. Very much there'll be in-depth knowledge of quality and safety, training methods, competence assessment, management principles, accuracy, attention to detail. The, the people who come away with these qualifications are very well equipped to take themselves and elsewhere in their career. Could I have the next slide, please, Dan? I love this slide a bit, so I hope you're all gonna like this one. The other really key message, and this underpins um, what Alan was saying about all of the core and key disciplines um, of accredited biomedical science degree. Biomedical scientists can be likened to a pluripotent stem cell. They have got everything inside them from their original degree that enables them to differentiate into any of those key disciplines. And once they've done their specialist diploma of specialized, it doesn't prevent them from changing or being retrained into a new discipline, which is a really important point um, when services merge, when new technologies come on board. The biomedical scientist workforce is probably one of the most flexible workforces in the NHS. And that's why the accredited biomedical science degree and the subsequent training routes produce people who are very much fit for purpose, but are an incredibly adaptable group. Could I, <clears throat> excuse me, next slide, thank you. Um, this is another really important point to make in the context of the more advanced qualifications. And we've quite regularly get people saying, oh, but biomedical scientists can't take on a more clinical role because of their standards of proficiency. And regulation, I want to dispel that, regulation isn't a barrier to a change of discipline or to an extension of the scope of practice. The biomedical scientist standards of proficiency, they are permissive rather than restrictive, and they are no barrier to more clinical roles. And if anyone feels minded to play snap with the biomedical and 
clinical scientist standards of proficiency, you'll see they're actually very similar. So um, those taking on or being developed into a more clinical role, you're not contravening your um, standards of proficiency, you're just extending the scope of practice. And another note about the specialist portfolios, they provide a really useful framework for retraining um, if somebody is going to change their discipline. Next slide, please, Dan. Thank you. The Higher Specialist Diploma has been around probably for 15 years plus, and it was developed as an alternative to master's degrees, as it, it was felt that our profession needed a qualification that exactly prepared them for the more senior roles that they were undertaking. And this is the core route, and until more recently was the main route from the specialist diploma. I would say it's a very challenging qualification and the people who graduate from this know all you need to know about running a laboratory virtually. It's two years of hard self-directed post-specialist study. It takes a particular sort of person, a very um, self-disciplined person to do this. And they emerge with a level seven equivalent qualification, which enables them to apply for band seven jobs um, as an alternative to a master's degree. Um, it's offered in all laboratory disciplines, all the key pathology disciplines. And as I said, it, it prepares people for senior roles because not only will they have an in-depth knowledge of their chosen science, they also will be um, well-versed in laboratory management, quality management training, and essentially all the elements with de delivering a service. Can I have the next slide, please, Dan? Now, at the beginning, I, I mentioned that some of our qualifications are complementary to that main higher specialist diploma route. And I want to take you first to the certificates of expert practice. And these are somewhat different from our other, all our other qualifications, because these are delivered through self-directed, uh, sorry, not through self-directed learning, they are delivered as a distance learning course. These are the subjects in which they're available. Laboratory training, and this is a very good course for aspirant training officers and training managers, or those who've just taken on the role and feel they'd like to be a little better equipped to deal with it. Quality management, this is massively oversubscribed, very, very um, popular course. Leadership and management, this is also a very useful complement to the higher specialist diploma or to somebody who has just done the specialist diploma and wants to go into a more management route. I'm going to highlight point of care testing because this is different. We, because we are aware it's a new qualification, we've had two sittings and we're aware that some people work exclusively in point of care testing and the specialist diploma is not suitable for them because it, they aren't exposed to the full range of modules in point of care testing as they would in a conventional pathology environment. So council has just agreed that for those in point of care testing who don't have a specialist diploma and for whom a specialist portfolio would not be suitable to undertake, this they can access the point of care testing certificate as a licentiate rather than requiring them to be a member. And they need two years um, full-time equivalent experience. And then they too can apply to become full members. It's as an alternative to a specialist diploma. And then lastly, there's molecular pathology, which is really aimed at people who are already in one of the traditional laboratory disciplines, but are taking on more and more molecular testing. Um, and this is a good introduction to molecular pathology and it's the aspects of it in all the other pathology disciplines. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dan. Um, these certificates are delivered as a 14 week distance learning course and they we run them annually starting in January. So if anyone wants to think about enrolling, um, now is the time to apply anytime up to mid-December. There are six 
two week modules plus a couple of study weeks and they're delivered through the University of Ulster um, uses Blackboard online learning platform. They provide a good broad introductory approach to content and as I've said they're suitable to biomedical scientists from all the disciplines and background. Um, Part way through there are mandatory reflective practice exercises and the endpoint examinations at the end of the course are a mixture of multiple choice questions and short answers and um, it requires a pass of 60% to pass that one. Next uh, slide please Dan. Thank you very much. The diplomas of expert practice um, originally used to be taken in addition but they're now seen increasingly as an alternative to the higher specialist diploma, as they are very much aimed at those with a or wanting a more clinical role or a role that overlaps with medical pathologists. And these are now seen as the qualification of choice, preparing people for advanced clinical practice roles. To enter or start training, you need approximately a couple of years of post specialist diploma studies. You need to be proficient in your own discipline before you really start to get to grips with these ones. And these require a blend usually of in-house and self-directed learning. And because of the overlap often with a pathologist role, um, people doing these qualifications tend to need the support of their pathologist as well as taking control of their learning themselves. And we'll have a look in a minute at what ones are covered, but these successful candidates are then equipped to apply for band seven roles, as are the people who emerge with the higher specialist diploma. And the other very key point to make is these people can also apply for admission onto the higher specialist, higher specialist scientific training program, HSST. And this has been a recent development this year. Um, it was done to address the shortage of people in clinical hematology. And it's also a route for people um, who've been through the dissection, histopathology dissection training. So that's, it's very important for biomedical scientists. It's this year we have had access, we've been granted access to the HSST. And we do need to thank Bernie Ferry and the National School of Health Science for their very supportive role they've played in supporting biomedical scientist development. Next slide, please, Dan. And you can see the qualifications we have as diplomas of expert practice. Histo dissection, that's very well established, has been around in excess of 10 years. Um, non, sorry, it should say non gynae cytology, not non gynae dissection, it's non gynae cytology, um, immunocytochemistry. And we are relaunching ultrastructural pathology, and that will be available beginning of next year, um, obviously, in electron microscopy. But we're aware there is increasing demand of biomedical scientists taking on more of a clinical liaison role in microbiology. So plans next year is a diploma of expert practice in, mycology, in microbiology with options available in mycology, infection prevention and control, pathogen genomics and antimicrobial management. And in hematology, again, there is becoming an incredibly um, much greater need for scientists to take on a more clinical role. So we have three options available from next year, which will be routine hematology, hemostasis and thrombosis and red cell disorders. And in case anyone is wondering what about white cell disorders, um, at the moment, it's a thought, but that is to be planned. That'll probably be the year after to complete that repertoire. Next slide, please. And then the top of the pile um, are the advanced specialist diplomas. And these obviously above, these are the above the level of the diplomas of expert practice. And these prepare people for biomedical scientist consultant equivalent roles and are viewed as an alternative to HSST. And I think this is an important message to get across that enabling access for biomedical scientists to train for the HSST, it doesn't suit everybody because the HSST is a broader qualification. 
Advanced specialist diplomas are much, much narrower in terms of their field and their scope, but are at the same level. So not all departments, not all individuals would want HSST. And for those, an advanced specialist diploma might be a preferable option. They're available in a very limited range of subjects, and we have been responding to service need. Um, they do prepare candidates for the scientist consultant role, and all of those that we have so far are operated through conjoint boards with the RC path because of the significant overlap here between the scientist and the medical consultant role. The training for these very much depend on um, in-house pathologist training and a strong relationship between the scientist workforce and the medical consultant workforce. And also there's a need for it's a lot of reliance on self-directed learning. It, it's important to stress these qualifications or the first is actually over 20 years old, which was the ASD in cervical cytology. And these are recognized in all four UK countries. So therefore they are highly transferable. And finally, Last slide, please, Dan. These are the subjects they currently are available in, which is the well-established cervical cytology and the only slightly more recent um, non-gynae cytology. Um, those are the first two reporting roles that scientists could undertake. And more recently, past six years, we've had the histopathology reporting qualification, which is available in three disciplines or three specialisms, I should say, of um, gastrointestinal tract, um, gyne pathology, and dermatopathology. And we also have an ASD in histological dissection, which enables the um, scientists to dissect the most complex of samples, um, including complex malignancies. So that's a really rapid whistle-stop tour of all our qualifications above the specialist diploma level, and hopefully you can see how they all fit together and the very different career options that these can lead to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. So um, hopefully everyone uh, has had a good whistle-stop tour of what the uh, IVMS can offer educationally um, in terms of our workforce. Uh, I've been keeping a close eye on the chat box and the Q&A section, so we've only got four minutes left, so I'm going to touch on some of the themes rather than any of the particular questions. I think the key one that's coming up a lot is around a making sure that people undertake the right degrees. So the first thing I'll perhaps cover is that the biomedical science degree protected title is something which we, we do wish to uh, look at and, and, and try and see if we can make a protected title. And of course, the lack of a protected title is exactly why we introduced the accredited degree approach. So you know, our, our response to the lack of a uh, protected title around biomedical sciences and biomedical science uh, was to, to introduce the accredited degree. So that's the first thing. So, so our first uh, thing will be that we will continue to lobby. And as we do, and, and Alan spends a lot of his time on this, making sure that universities that offer biomedical science do meet the terms and the curricula required for a biomedical science degree to be used um, for uh, HCPC registrations of biomedical scientists. That, that's the first thing. And we do work very closely with uh, an organisation called Huckbums, which is the higher education body looking after biomedical science, try to ensure that they support that. But actually, as it happens at the moment and uh, around that is that uh, they're not minded, uh, but we continue to work closely with them to make sure that, uh, that they understand the importance of biomedical science. The other thing to note, of course, is where there are protected degree titles, they often are related to uh, a one in one, uh, one uh, individual student to a role that's already available within the NHS. So if you're undertaking things like uh, paramedic science, then you actually already have a job uh, as a paramedic, so, uh, or at least a trainee paramedic. So again, within biomedical science, bear in mind that no, not all of the students within biomedical science go into biomedical science as a, as a protected type of profession. Uh, it makes that, uh, art, that ask much more challenging. And I think also, of course, that most degrees are modular. So that does mean that uh, we do have to assess each degree because uh, uh, I can give an example of a colleague of mine when I was undertaking my degree who did uh, Russian, beginning Russian, uh, but he still ended up with a degree in biomedical science. So every individual degree needs to be assessed very carefully. Uh, the other thing that's a very clear message um, alongside the how we work to with the higher education institutes to drive forward um, people use, taking undertaking the right degree to come into the profession. So the, the programmes 
uh, required to bring their degree up to quotations is less. Uh, is we also need to look at how we capture our A level students. So uh, something else that we're doing as part of our strategy that um, uh, that improving access to HCPC includes an educational piece to A level students who are looking to undertake uh, degrees. Uh, they need to look at undertaking biomedical science as a degree, as opposed to biomedical sciences, because the, the protected title is bio, or the, the work we're doing around accredited, accredited biomedical science degrees is that they're called biomedical science. Uh, so that, that's a, a key thing. The other thing we had as well is about um, uh, um, spreading out um, uh, the way that we uh, bring people on board, making less generic. Again, one of the HCPCs uh, requirements for biomedical scientists is that they are generic in their training. They've got a very broad base. Uh, personally, I would say that's inc incredibly important, as Sarah said about the pluripotentiary uh, stem cell. Uh, that's what makes this workforce so versatile, actually, is having that very early on generic, broad ranging training. <clears throat> so, again, I think we should make sure that when we're looking at what our workforce is for, that we understand the difference in clinical scientists, where it is quite targeted, versus biomedical scientists, where actually the, the start point is actually quite a, a generic, pluripotential uh, individual. Um, and the other thing that uh, I suppose to, to really pick up on is how do you make sure that actually the when people do undertake degrees which are not accredited, how do you make sure that those the cost of those being kept down as, as far as we can? And again, it's like we're working with the uh, higher education, uh, that the uh, health education bodies, uh, to see what we can do to support funding around that to improve that. You know, there are, there are um, Alan will correct me if I'm wrong, but there are. Uh, upwards of uh, 30, 40 accredited degrees uh, uh, in the UK, uh, but there are probably many more which are not accredited. So we need to make sure that uh, we build people's understanding on that. Uh, and what's the exact figure of accredited degrees? We've got just over 50 in the UK, about 11 overseas, but there okay. are a number of main universities, um, Aberdeen, Sheffield, in London, that have non-accredited degrees. Yeah. They go by the name of biomedical sciences. They bear little resemblance because the universities like flexibility to offer the types of modules that they want to. Some yeah. of them even lack um, actual practical research projects. Okay, thank you. So you see there's much work to do and again part of our strategy definitely is around making sure that we're, uh, we as the Institute are doing all we can to exercise uh, our influence over areas we don't control uh, to make sure that the workforce coming in uh, come in fit for purpose. Uh, and I, I was, my my initial plea to you is anyone who's out there being uh, undertaking uh, any advice you're being asked to to provide to A level uh, students is to make sure they're taking a biomedical science degree. This is a credit. Uh, and, and the other point I want to to touch on is around is about how we make sure we link training officers to the. Uh, practice educators. Uh, I'll just, we will discuss with Ruth about how we do that and we'll, we'll find some way to make sure that uh, in some way, shape or form, we can link them together. Ruth's got a thumbs up so uh, we can make sure we do that. Um, so uh, we're acutely aware of the time, we're a minute over, so I don't want to, to, to hold you any longer than we need to. Um, but uh, I'd just like to say thank you to my colleagues uh, and Ruth in particular for coming and joining us. Uh, we do want to make these webinars a more regular event uh, to give more time for Q&As. Um, so uh, please look out your inboxes for more events such as this. I, I would like to do uh, monthly, but uh, as all these things, that can be quite ambitious and I'm aware that everyone's very busy, but we'll see what we can do to see how that, how that comes together to make sure we increase our engagement. Uh, again, as part of the comments around um, what we do, uh, engagement with our members is a vital part of us and, and certainly under my tenure and under our new strategy, we need to make sure that people work more collegially across the board there. Uh, and I'll just end with a heartfelt thank you everyone who's joined us today uh, to hear what we have to say and I wish you a very happy National Pathology Week. Uh, I hope whatever you do to raise the profile of our wonderful profession uh, comes uh, with smiles and giggles, etc., um, and that um, uh, we again will celebrate what is a fantastic profession that has served our country so very well the last two years. So, thank you all. Uh, we'll see you again very soon, hopefully, and uh, thank you for your contributions. Thank you. <laughs>